Yes, you read that right. Science-based educators have been wrong before. But don't lose your faith in science because science is how you get closer to the truth. However, in that pursuit, there are times where things change over time, where we learn more and we have to readjust our thinking. And that's what being truly evidence-based is about, changing your mind in the face of new data. So let's look at five times. We told you, hey, the current scientific evidence shows this, therefore it's probably better to do that. But then after a few years, things changed, and so did our recommendations. Starting off with the protein absorption limit. For years, many, including myself, claimed that it seems, based on the evidence at that time, 20 to 40 grams of protein was the soft cutoff limit as far as protein used for muscle building purposes per meal. For those looking to maximize gain, the recommendation was to space protein in four to six meals, depending obviously on your weight and the amount of protein that you required, and to make sure that you have frequent protein feedings, not for your metabolism or any of that jazz, but rather to continuously spike and stimulate muscle protein synthesis. However, a recent study by Tromal and et al. essentially compared the ingestion of 25 versus 100 grams of milk protein ingested post-workout in untrained individuals, and they saw that 100 grams resulted in a much prolonged anabolic response versus 25 grams. And that study sort of changed our mind and showed that, hey, it is possible to remain anabolic even if you have a huge, huge protein feeding and it is not going to go to waste. Not that people claim that it would be wasted. People hypothesized about how the rest of the protein may be used for other functions or some even straight up predicted what the study found and said that it's likely that you are staying more anabolic where as long as you're consuming enough protein throughout the day, you're likely making a ton of gains. Another thing that many jumped on back in the day and at no fault is the idea that higher training frequencies promote greater muscle growth. There was a meta-analysis by Schoenfeld et al, which essentially showed that a greater training frequency resulted in greater hypertrophy. The same authors though, a few years later, performed an updated meta-analysis and showed that, hey, actually, if volume is equated, Frequency does not seem to play that much role in muscle building and maximizing muscle growth. But back in the day, especially when that systematic review came out, for a couple of years, the idea of training your, let's say, biceps twice a week was promoted as something that could potentially lead to significantly more growth. And you would often hear things like, oh, you're stimulating protein synthesis more frequently, therefore you're growing more. That was how this was presented. Based on our current knowledge, as long as you're getting the same volume in, gains are likely going to be the same, even if you're training a muscle two or three times per week. I personally still recommend for the majority of people that want to maximize adaptations that they do split their volume across different sessions per week to make things manageable. But as it stands, the evidence-based recommendation is that as long as you're getting enough volume in, frequency is likely not gonna make a huge difference as far as your gains go. Moving on to EMG, and EMG specifically essentially measuring a muscle's activity during an exercise, using that in studies to infer muscle growth, to essentially predict muscle growth based on EMG activity. Recent studies have shown that that does not reliably predict hypertrophy. And if we look at exercises like the conventional deadlift and EMG data, we see that the quads are actually among the most activated muscles. But I don't think it's very wise to have a conventional deadlift as your main quad exercise. And you'd be much better off with a deep squat emphasizing the stretch. Back in the day though, and we saw that with many acute studies that people relied on and then falsely translated as evidence-based where they said, oh, in this study, we saw greater activation of this and this and that. Therefore, this exercise is likely to grow this muscle more than others. 
Intuitively, it does make sense. Oh, more activation, therefore more growth, but EMG comes with limitations. Other muscles can interfere in the EMG readings. And as far as actual evidence, we have enough evidence now to show that EMG is probably not a valid predictor of muscle hypertrophy. Next up is controlling, and I mean really controlling the eccentric on exercise. Now, as far as some control goes, sure, I think that that's a wise recommendation because it sort of safeguards you from missing out on potential gains. But when it comes to the current scientific evidence and we published a narrative review, AKA a glorified blog post on training technique where we looked at the literature on eccentric versus concentric tempos, as long as your entire repetition duration is somewhere in the two to eight second range, you are likely, at least based on our current understanding, maximizing adaptations. I can hear some of you saying, but the eccentric is so much more hypertrophic than the concentric. However, if you look closely at the literature, those differences are not as great as you may think. If we look at the current available evidence on concentric versus eccentric actions, there are not really huge differences there as far as hypertrophy goes. What about isometrics, you ask? We don't know that well yet, but you never know. It may be that in five to 10 years, isometrics at long muscle lengths are the new thing. You heard it here first. Study coming out, I don't know when, but in the next half a year or so, I assume we will have it ready to go. Last but not least, and I know, trigger warning, full range of motion for maximizing hypertrophy. Many of us, including myself, we're big proponents of utilizing a full range of motion, really controlling the eccentric to maximize hypertrophy. But as it stands, the data for full range of motion being superior to partials at long muscle lengths for maximizing hypertrophy is just not there. I get it. It's what we're used to doing. I still train with a full range of motion on many exercises, but it may be and the literature is still relatively young and we need more data on trained individuals and some other muscle groups, which we're on to. We are currently conducting that study in NYC. And by the time this video is coming out, we should have the results out soon. However, the idea that a full range of motion is the best thing and is a must for maximizing hypertrophy is an idea that as it stands, is not evidence-based. And there you have it, five times where as evidence-based practitioners, we had to change our minds on new data. And I hear you say, but Pac, how can we trust all this science when it's proven wrong so many times? Well, as far as the basics go, nothing has really changed. Consistently training hard and performing a couple of exercises per muscle group is going to get you the majority of your gains. But when it comes to maximizing and getting closer to the truth behind what actually drives maximum muscle growth, that's where science is still our best tool. Listening to what one bodybuilder or powerlifter or coach or whatever did back in the day is not the way to go. Because there's another bodybuilder or powerlifter with equal sort of credentials and success that will say an opposite thing. There were low volume proponents back in the day and high volume proponents. Arnold said, and if you have the book, Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, you can say, he says, emphasize the stretch on everything. Take your muscles, and he says it exactly like that, to the longest range of motion possible, and then come all the way down and then squeeze. There were others that were proponents of doing partials as well. Uh, others that were proponents of doing shortened partials. So science is still the best tool that we have at getting closer to the truth. Welcome new evidence, welcome change, because we're not talking about change that will take your training from being completely ineffective to totally ineffective. We're talking about the details here. And it's likely that you're not missing out on a ton of gains if you're just training hard, you have strict technique, even if you emphasize the eccentric a bit more, or even if you did only full range of motion, it's very likely that you haven't missed on much. But getting closer to the truth is the game of science and keeping an open mind and being open to changing that mind is key in being truly evidence-based. <laughs> That's it for today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification icon, code Pack for 10% off Rascal Apparel 
get you some fresh drip. MyOdap.com for the best app that is not out yet, but will come out soon and will coach you to amazing gains. That's the real science. Express interest, link in description, and a bunch of free programs. Also, links in description. What else do you need? Thank you so much for watching. Peace!